record. I shall share my, I shall share my screen. Oh, wrong one. <laughs> Nearly got the wrong one. Um, and then I'll set Ian away. That's brilliant. At the last presentation, Ian was um, showing us some thin slice analysis. Is that right? Where you slice the stone really thin? And I got very excited and he promised that there will be more of that tonight. So I have brought popcorn for this. So <laughs> up to you, Ian. Great. Thank you very much indeed, Kerry. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, lovely to see uh, so many familiar faces again. Um, and, and just in case there are some people out there who've, who've arrived just for this um, particularly fascinating talk. Um, my name's Ian Kill and I'm the community geologist for the Hadrian's Wall Community Archaeology Project. And the particular reason for my being a part of this project is a thing called the Stone Sourcing and Dispersal Project, which pretty much does what it says on the can. Um, it's about understanding where the stone from Hadrian's Wall came from um, and uh, where it has gone to afterwards. Um, hence the title, Who Stole the Wall? Um, and it's a project which um, I'm absolutely delighted and very excited to be a part of, but not only from the point of view of, of being able to um, explore a really rather interesting uh, research project, um, which the Stone Sourcing and Dispersal Project represents in part of its aspect, but also being um, part of a, of a wonderful team that is engaging with um, the great communities across the, the, the length of Hadrian's Wall in order to be able to do some citizen science to be able to help understand what's going on with the wall. Um, and it is just such an amazing um, place to be, both in terms of its landscape, the archaeology, uh, and also the geology has a lot to, of stories to tell. So, uh, a week or so ago, um, after the snow went away, um, I, I went out for my uh, daily constitutional um, down, down towards Tynemouth. Um, and I was quite surprised when I got there to find that, that Tynemouth Priory was actually open. Um, so I took the opportunity to, to, to go in and have a wander around. Um, I'd been, it had been su suggested to me by some, uh, a friend of mine who posted some pictures a while back, that there were some really interesting features to see um, inside um, the Priory and I was really not disappointed and if I could have the first slide please Gary. So one of the things that struck me um, in wandering around this uh, rather amazing um, graveyard um, is, is just how familiar the cycle of birth, uh, life and death is to us. Um, and, and it's a cycle that defines us um, and our animal and plant cohabitees on this, this planet. And much of our thinking is marked out by our four score years and ten, and, and by the graduations of that that are linked to our cultural, developmental and our political timescales. But sometimes we, we get these clues which take us into deeper time. And, and here in Tynemouth, these 200 year old gravestones have been beautifully etched by the slow but persistent process of erosion. And this made me aware of the power that these incremental processes have when they're combined with, with lots of time. So what happens then if we, if we open up our minds to the idea, not just of historical time, and I mean by that time, which is measured in, in hundreds and sometimes thousands of years. Start to talk about hundreds of thousands and indeed millions of years. And it raises the question about what can be achieved by these incremental processes driven by wind, water, ice, when you have epic amounts of time. So from a geologist's point of view to uh, understand the, the history and prehistory of the material aspects of Hadrian's Wall. To my mind, dwelling in this deep time is essential. So what I would like to do with this talk is to, is to dwell in deep time. So to trace the life cycle of Hadrian's Wall from its geological foundation, right the way through to its current state of decay and indeed its redistribution. So uh, as with any good story, um, the narrator needs a perspective 
and I, I thought it would be interesting to take the point of view of one of the um, component minerals that make up the wall sandstone. And the choice for this was kind of obvious. So what I didn't want was a character like that of, of Ned Stark in the, in the wall featuring series of the Game of Thrones, uh, who was killed off in the first series. Uh, what I needed was someone who's more of a Tyrion Lannister, as it were, um, who has a really gritty determination uh, and seem, seems to survive despite being uh, knocked about rather a lot and being con considerably moved about and transported all over the place. So the character, which is a major mineral component of the wall and which can be followed right the way through this story is that of quartz. I could have the next slide, please, uh, Kerry. So what is quartz? Well, quartz is amazing. It's really beautiful. Um, and here's some examples of some crystalline bits of quartz. So smoky quartz on the right, uh, clear quartz in the middle and some amethyst on the right. Um, and yeah, quartz is a bit of a, of a party animal in terms of its colors. And if I could have the next slide, please. It, it does really fancy. Um, so here's some, some agates with some of the extraordinary colors and, and, and patterns that, that, that quartz can make um, in the natural world. And if we go to the next slide, please. Though it has to be said that uh, quartz more often looks like this. So on the left, um, here we have some, some vein quartz um, up in the, uh, the Borrowdale vol Volcanics in the Lake District. Um, and on the right, some of the typical types of, of quartz pebbles, which you, you find um, on the beach, um, a rather matte, gray, white, yellowy sort of color. The thing about quartz is that it is really hard. Um, it's not quite up there with, uh, with sapphire and diamond in terms, in terms of its hardness, but it's really uh, not far off in terms of its, its ability to be really hard. Go to the next slide, please. And quartz is made of, of from a chemical point of view, it's made from, from two elements, silicon and oxygen. Um, quartz is silicon dioxide. And one of the interesting things about uh, silicon, um, and um, I have here the uh, periodic table, the elements, and, and those chemists among you will know that if you follow the columns um, in the periodic table, um, that the columns tend to have family affinities. So if you read up and down, things which are in the same column have some of the, the similar sorts of attributes. Um, and if you could just give me the next animation, please, Kerry. And it just so happens that silicon and carbon are uh, one above each other in the, in, the, in, the, in the periodic table of the elements. If we go to the next slide, please. And we know that carbon is, uh, is extraordinary in the diversity of the way in which it operates. So um, not only can you find it, uh, if you like, in its uh, uh, raw form as, as just carbon in the shape of coal, um, but also, if we go to the next animation, please, um, carbon also comes as diamond. But also when you mix carbon with, with a whole bunch of other elements, if we go to the next animation, please, it's capable of forming all sorts of amazing and complex uh, molecules. And indeed, some of those molecules are things that, that form the very foundation of, of, of what we are made of. Now, silicon, if we could have the next slide, please, has a similar ability. Um, it, 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 it is able to, not only in its, its raw metallic form, but once it's mixed with other elements, it produces all sorts of fantastic and, and, and complex minerals. Um, and just as an aside, uh, John Scott, uh, uh, hello John, um, was uh, complimenting one of the uh, presentations earlier on for the uh, number of terms in it, which he was going to go away and have to, uh, to look up afterwards. So um, this slide is specially for you, John. Um, so knock yourself out with all of these. Um, so, uh, Kerry, if you could just uh, just uh, run through the, the next set of animations. So what we have here is olivine on the left, and then we have a feldspar, plagioclase uh, feldspar, um, calcium-rich feldspar, and pyroxene, all of which are the sorts of minerals which you find within, um, within basaltic types of rocks. And then we've had alkali feldspar coming up, and beneath that, this wonderful, beautiful black piece of amphibole, 
and next up is Muscovite mica and these three along with quartz are the sorts of things which you find within granite and indeed there are other exotic um, uh, um, silicates and the remaining two on the right hand side uh, which are tourmalin or garnet at the bottom and tourmaline at the top um, and there are many, many others. So there are zeolites and clay minerals, and indeed is the, uh, the evil cousin of the silicate family asbestos. These are all silicates, um, and they're all important um, members of, of the, what are known as the rock forming minerals. So a very high percentage of the types of rocks you will find are made up of, of, of these silicate types of minerals. But it is quartz that is far and away um, the most durable of these minerals, both in its chemical and in its physical properties. So it's quartz that is the real survivor of this. So we have the next slide, please, Gary, thanks. So as I was saying, granite is um, really the starting point um, for this journey, this life cycle that we're going to follow in order to understand a bit about um, the components of, of, of Hadrian's wall. And granite, if we could have the next animation, please. Um, the first picture I showed you was of a piece of granite from Criffel um, in uh, just to the north of the Solway Firth. Um, um, and that plays a part in some of the geological story of, of, of Hadrian's wall. And what you see if you can, if you zoom in on this granite, which is what this second animation is, you can see some of the mineral components in here. So the grey um, mineral that you can see, which forms quite a high percentage of, of, of this um, slide, um, is, uh, is quartz. Um, the white, um, bright white colour is feldspar, um, and the bright coloured mineral is probably a mixture of amphibole and maybe a little bit of mica in there as well. Now the thing is that even when a, when a granite is formed, I should probably explain the granite is explained, um, by, uh, from, from a liquid magma, uh, a magma which is obviously rich in, in, in silica um, and other um, alkaline elements, um, which then cools down and crystallizes to, to, to form this, this material. And granites are uh, one of the uh, most common uh, igneous rocks that you find within continents. Um, and I emphasize within continents because if we look across the whole of the planet, in fact, basalts are by far and away the most common um, igneous material, and that's because most of the ocean floor is composed of basalt. So what happens after a granite um, is, is, is formed and is starting to cool? I could have the next slide, please, Kerry. So here we are, we've gone down to Cornwall. Um, and Cornwall is particularly interesting from this point of view. Um, Cornwall is the source of um, clay um, and the sort of clay, high quality clay, which is used in, in, in making porcelain. Um, and the reason why it's a really important source of clay is because the outside of the really large granite intrusions, which you find in Exmoor um, and Dartmoor, um, as the granite was cooling down, there was a major hydrothermal system which interacted with the, the, the outer layer of the granite. And that hydrothermal system, the heat and the particular chemical uh, constituency of it, basically started to break down the granite in situ. The quartz was a survivor in this, but the feldspars in particular got broken down um, into kaolin and some of these other um, clay minerals, of which there are, are, are many. Um, clay minerals is an entire lecture all on its own. Um, and, and it's this kaolin which forms this very fine clay material uh, which um, is used as, as a constituent in really good quality clays. Um, and the old pits, um, which is where the uh, kaolin used to be washed out of, of these, these massive great quarries using enormous hoses in order to wash them out, um, forming this amazing uh, moonscape. Uh, has now been reclaimed as, uh, as part of the Eden project. So that's the starting point. Um, the granite starts to erode, to, to weather in situ. So what happens next? Let's have a look at the next slide. 
what is it that takes the courts from things which like look like things on, on the left hand side to the, the next animation, please, Kerry, to something which is much more rounded and polished? <laughs> well, in, in this particular case, uh, uh, the uh, journey was one which was done via a tumble polisher. Um, however, the action of a tumble polisher is, is, is very much the sort of thing that, that, that happens in the natural environment too. So let's explore the various routes that, 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 that might take the quartz crystals on the le left outwards. So um, the Himalayas in Nepal um, is a place, a, a mountainous area, um, which contains uh, an amount of sedimentary material, but also it contains a lot of um, gritic material where there's plenty of, of hard, hard quartz rich material, which is being eroded. And there are various routes from those mountain sources um, outwards. So um, the ice and glaciers on top of the mountains will crack open the granitic material and start breaking it down up there. And the combination of landslides and ice melting and ice movement will start to move that material away from the mountain and out into the, uh, in this case, the massive river system that is the Ganges Delta um, through, through the river systems, um, which is a sink for some of the, uh, of the, of the quartz grains, um, and then out into the, um, into the Bay of Bengal. Um, and indeed, uh, in the Bay of Bengal, um, there are large amounts of sand and clay and other plastic material which is deposited out in, in the sea there. But also the sea, the oceans and the way they work, they not only um, take in that um, broken down quartz material, but some of it also gets washed back. Um, and uh, any of you who, who maybe have been out to, to Whitley Bay recently will have seen that the, the really stormy weather that we've had during this snowy season has actually ripped off a lot of the, the sandy material from the surface of the beach there, leaving it almost bare of sand. But over the summer period, that sand will then come back onto the beach again. So here we have some of the major locations in which that sandy material, which is broken down from the mountains is actually deposited in within the fluvial, the river systems, but also within the sea, the deep sea, but also within the, the foreshore in which that material gets recycled into. The next slide, please. And also, if we look in the other direction from the Himalayas, we can see that some of that material uh, moves off sideways through the river system and into some of the of the, of the lacustre and the lake systems which sit um, within the uh, Tibetan side of, of the, the Himalayan landscape and indeed get taken further off um, out into to the Gobi Desert here um, where sand goes into a massive great basin here where very large amounts of, 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 of sand um, are sunk within within a desert landscape where wind is the major force which is, is, is moving, uh, moving this material around rather than ice and water. Okay, if we go to the next slide, please. So here is some of the, what, what this looks like uh, on the journey through the landscape. So on the left, we have a, a, a landslide um, which has brought material down from um, the high peaks in the Himalayas. And you can see the angular, uh, very mixed nature of, of the material which you have within this uh, within this landslide and if we have a look at the next animation please um, also for the Himalayas but this is a material which has been transported through um, a combination of ice but also um, water um, and again this this fluvio glacial material here has a whole mixture of different sizes of, of, of grains in it from the very finest of clays right the way up to um, not quite such angular um, but nonetheless um, still a bit rough around the edges um, blocks of material. And if we go from the next slide please Kerry. Um, and as the uh, grains progress through the fluvial system um, and this picture is is from um, the grains within the, uh, the Colorado River and what you can see here is that the grains are progressively becoming 
less angular, um, more rounded, but still quite a mixture of all sorts of different types of mineral in here. Um, as they are transported further and further away from, from the source. If we could have a look at the next animation, please, Gary. Um, and these are the next two animations. Uh, this one on the next one, please, um, are beach sands. And what you can see here, as we've gone even further away from the source, um, and the, um, the quartz has been through more of the tumble polishing action that you have, um, both within the, the rivers and also within the action of the waves within the sea and the currents that you find in the sea. But those grains have been rounded even more and um, the minerals other than quartz have been broken down physically and chemically and you're left with a much purer mixture of quite rounded grains of quartz. If you go to the next slide please Kerry. But just as an aside, the beach sand isn't necessarily made of the very um, resilient grains of quartz that sometimes, like on this beach in Jamaica, you can have sand which is made of um, this rather softer and less durable olivine. Um, and the reason why you have this is in this particular location, the cliffs which are behind this beach are pretty much made of the olivine which is on the beach. So in this case, the material which makes up um, the sand comes from somewhere which is really very nearby. And it is this combination of the different types of process, how far away uh, the material has traveled, traveled, how long it has been in um, the system um, for, which gives some of the diversity of the different types of sandstone that get preserved within the geological record. And it's this which allows us to distinguish different types of sandstone when we find them. So for example, if I could have the next slide, please. I talked about the Gobi Desert um, and the way that wind will actually redistribute um, uh, sand grains and, and other minerals around within that desert environment. And what we have on the left is an example of a thing which is goes by the name of a, of a dry canter. Um, a German name which means um, basically three faces. And it's one of the things that happens in, in desert environments. Um, it produces these um, astonishing and rather beautiful, really sharp edges in the way in which um, stones in this case get eroded, but also the, the really quite fine grain, mineral grains, including the quartz grains that you find in particles which make up desert material. And the other thing which you, you get is a thing called desert varnish, which, which is an example on the right hand side, where stones and indeed the very fine grains which make up the sort of sands and sandstones which you get in desert environments, have got this shiny iron uh, patina um, on the surface of the grains, which means that when you find sandstones which have got grains, which mean they have been formed in a desert environment, it means you can recognise them and you can distinguish them from other types of sandstone. So can I have the next slide, please, Gary? So along with these mineral types, mineral shapes, and the way in which those mineral grains have been sorted and tumbled, we can also pick up some information to help us understand what's going on in the sandstones from the sorts of patterns which you find on them. So here we've got um, a, a set of examples of different types of patterns that you might find in sandstone. So the first three of these um, are examples of um, cross bedding. So the top two are thing called planar cross bedding, where you have these um, sets, as these coarse layers are called, which within them have these fine bandings, which are at this regular um, shallow angle going across it, which are brought about by um, ripples moving across the surface of the bed in which the sands are being laid down. So if you like, these patterns are the, the ghost of, 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 um, of ripples um, from these ancient river, rivers, uh, in this case preserved from some 350 million years ago on, on the Northumberland coast. And the one at the bottom is a, is a similar sort of thing, but here we have trough cross bedding where 
small channels of, of, of sand are migrating across the, um, the surface of a riverbed and maybe in, in, in channel bars to produce these sorts of formations. And if we could have a look at the next set, please, Kerry. Um, here are some examples of the sorts of things which we find within the Hadrian Small area. So the top two pictures, uh, uh, Tom, at the top, you will recognise those who are in the presentation um, earlier on on Walltown Crags. This is from a, a small outcrop very close to Walltown Crags with a really nice example of, of cross bedding. And below that, we have some um, parallel sets of, of, of bedding, very fine bedding, which is very distinctive and, and found in the quarry um, at Lady Cross, um, which, are, which I hope we may be able to get out and go and visit uh, sometime later in this year. And the bottom is an example of the way sometimes you find on the, on the surface of bedding, bedding planes within sandstones, um, these beautifully preserved um, ripples, the actual ripples themselves in the surface of the sandstone. If we have to look at the last two, um, we have some slightly more exotic structures um, where the rate at which um, sand is deposited is so fast that the water within um, the, the, the sand accumulation gets trapped. And at some point, um, that the whole of this system is out of equilibrium. There's water inside that, that sand. There's so much of it, it wants to get out. It wants to escape um, up to the surface. Um, but there's more sediment being added the whole time. But sometimes due to well, maybe a, um, an earthquake or, um, or a heavy footed amphibian crossing across the top of the, of the surface, um, that uh, unstable equilibrium is, is broken and the water will find its way out in a, in, into, into, a, into a, a mud volcano or something like that. And that water as it escapes will completely disrupt the patterns within the, uh, the sedimentary to produce these extraordinary uh, water escape structures, which are really distinctive and really useful in terms of, of categorising the types of sandstones which you find. Go to the next slide, please, Kerry. I promise Kerry thin sections, and here they are. Um, so, the best way sometimes to really understand what's going on inside a rock is to, is to, is to look up really close and in person. Um, and the best way of doing that is by cutting the rocks into very, very thin slices. And these are about 0.2 uh, of a millimeter um, thick. So you can shine a light through them um, using a petrographic microscope, which gives you lots of useful information about exactly what types of grain you've got going on in there, where there aren't grains, um, and the way in which those grains are behaving. So what we've got here is the, the white bits um, in this are quartz grains. And as you can see, they're reasonably well-rounded. Um, the blue bits are actually holes. So um, the, the way in which we do this with, with in sections is to impregnate the rock uh, with resin, which has been stained with this uh, obviously not mineral blue. And that helps us understand where there are where there are holes, pore spaces within the rock. Um, um, and there are some other things going on in here as well. So if you look down towards um, the bottom of the slide, you'll see there is a, a squarish rectilinear grain um, of quartz just to the right of the, of the really dark patch. And if you look very closely, you will see that there's a sort of shadow outline inside a slightly um, fainter uh, outline outside of that, all of which is the same mineral, that they have the same crystalline structure. But that shadow line in the middle of that rectilinear structure is the original grain of quartz that was laid down at the time that, that the sandstone was being formed um, in a river in this case. And that as the, as the, um, after the sediment was laid down, water percolating through this, this poor structure that you can see in front of you crystallizes more quartz on the surface of this quartz grain. So you can see the quartz, original quartz grain is gradually growing into the spaces around the outside of it. And in fact, the, the dark um, brownie colored material to the left of that grain is made of, 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 of a mixture of iron um, and also um, calcium carbonate calcite which is also growing within these pore spaces. 
Um, now, this particular specimen um, comes from um, some work which I did with the Lindisfarne Peregrini project and is actually um, part of one of the sandstones that was um, used to construct the medieval chapel on top of the Hoof um, on Lindisfarne. Um, so it's quite a, um, an exotic piece of, of a material. And there were two types of sandstone within that, uh, uh, within that uh, uh, medieval chapel. Um, this is part of the stuff that was used in order to construct the, the upright walls and was, and was quite a soft white sandstone. And if we look at the next slide, we can see something which looks quite different. Um, and in this slide, um, Kerry's looking worried, which means that something's gone wrong with the... <laughs> Have we got the next slide there, Kerry? Hmm. Ah, here we go. Yes, excellent. Next slide is right. So this next slide, as you can see, is quite different. Um, the amount of blue in this is uh, greatly reduced. Um, there are still blue patches there, but what has happened is that you've got a combination. There's a certain amount of brown, brown particularly if you look at the top left, um, you will see um, that there is some brownie material in there, which is, which is iron. Um, probably a mixture of iron oxide and iron carbonate. You can see that distributed around various places around the, the, the grains, particularly coating some of the grains. And also you've got this sort of rather fuzzy, grubby looking mass, which is actually calcite in this particular case. And now this particular sandstone, um, and another interesting point is that the grains in this one are much more angular. So obviously there's been more growth in here and these, this particular sandstone was one of the ones which is, was used for the construction of the massive foundation stones of the, um, of the, of the, of, of the chapel, um, which are much harder, much stronger, much more durable. Part of the reason why that's the case is because the cement which is holding those, this sandstone together is much more developed and therefore makes the sandstone much harder. And if we could have a look at the next slide, please Kerry. Yay, Kerry's looking happy, so that's good. So, um, and this is a sandstone which um, was taken from a piece of work I did on the Willington Wagonway. Um, and we took samples from various places around, and this, this is from a, a piece of sandstone which has got the, the uh, wonderful name of the grindstone post, which gives a bit of a clue that this is actually a really, really hard sandstone. And uh, absolutely it was. Um, this was quite entertaining to try and break open in pieces and then try and cut up in order to uh, make into a, a, a thin section. Um, and as you can see, the white pieces in this, again, are quite angular pieces of quartz, but there's all sorts of other material in here as well. So you can see in the top middle of it, you've got a, a thin um, piece of material, which, yeah, that's great, thanks, Kerry, um, which is a piece of mica, and there's, there's another piece just to the to, to just nearby to the right of it, and also a flattish piece across to the left, um, almost brown. Keep going, keep going up, up a bit, right a bit, down a bit, pale brown, sort of hex. Yeah, you're there. That's the one. Um, uh, fire. It's like uh, what's his name? Yeah, mm. um, Huey Green. Yes. Um, so. Um, that's another piece of mica, and you can see the, the, the almost hexagonal outline of the crystal in that particular one as well. But the, uh, thank you, David. Yes, golden shot. That's the one. Um, the, um, the the rest of it is cement. It's stuff which is formed after um, the, the 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 sandstone was uh, sand for the sandstone was laid down, um, and and the the, the diagenetic. Um, cementation of this stone and as you can see there's no pore space here at all and it's part of the reason why it's so hard. But if we can have the next animation please Kerry. Um, one of the clever things which you can do with a petrographic microscope um, is look at it under polarized light which gives all sorts of um, fascinating information about the um, uh, about, about, about the, the, the mineral types within and gives yet more colour and excitement in, in terms of what's going on within the slide. Um, and that is just arriving and it's fading in very beautifully and slowly. Um, so I hope you can all see that. And one of the things which I wanted to point out in that is if you look um, at the, um, the, the, the top right hand side about here on the slide, um, 
you will see that it's this sort of iridescent sort of thing with an outline around the outside of it. And what this matrix is made of is not just a, a mush of whole, whole different series of small grains. It's actually made of really quite large crystals which wrap around um, the outside of the grain so that the, the cement itself is made of a whole series of interlocking grain uh, crystals of, of, of calcite, which adds to the, the whole strength of, the, uh, of, of this particular sandstone. So the reason for showing you these, um, and just to give you a sense of the scale of these, the mineral growth grains that we're looking at here, and in, indeed I should have said in all of these thin sections, each of the grains is about one millimetre across. So we're looking at really quite tiny things here. So the reason for showing you this is to give you a clue that there is a relationship between the quality of building materials and what they look like and the sorts of things which we can um, understand from the, um, the, the sandstones and the way in that which they're formed by looking in detail um, in, in, inside those sandstones. Grand, if we could have a look at the next slide, please. This is one of the great things about, um, um, about bandwidth, is it comes and it goes. Um, and it looks like um, Hedden is having a, a, a bad moment for its bandwidth. Um, it <laughs> I'll tell you what I'm going to do, Kerry. I'm just going to take a, a brief pause um, because I, I printed myself off um, a picture of all my slides that I could follow through them here whilst just in case there was a delay on it and what I'm going to do is I'm going to get that so I can keep on talking to the slides uh, whilst we're waiting for it to come up so um, bear with me just a moment folks. And actually, I'll tell you what I might also do so whilst we're waiting, Gary, is just to um, pick up one or two of the questions that, that have been asked on the chat as well. Um, so I seem to have managed to um, uh, get John going nicely on Google. So great. Good stuff. Thanks, John. Um, and uh, yeah. Uh, David, yes, there will definitely be a test at the end. So uh, yeah, keep making the notes. Um, although having said that, um, everything which I've said here, pretty much, um, you can find within the um, stone sourcing and dispersal guides which were written during lockdown. So if there's any terminology um, or explanation of, of a lot of this material, um, just go to the, um, uh, to the SSD guides um, and there's everything in you need there to, to refresh your mind or to and pick up the information about it uh, and more. There's, there's more than in there than I'm talking about tonight. And yes, um, <laughs> indeed, thin sections are beautiful, beautiful things. Um, and uh, um, yeah, I can uh, well imagine that, that uh, there is a, a scope for um, uh, 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 merchandising all of this. And in fact, uh, I don't know if, um, one of the things that I've been doing during lockdown is I've written a whole series of blogs and the one which I wrote for Christmas, which was uh, basically uh, an excuse to have lots and lots of pretty pictures of, uh, uh, of Agate. Um, there's a, a, a colleague of mine out in Italy um, who, who goes under the name of At Microscopia, um, who's taken some absolutely fabulous images of um, all sorts of things. And some of the images which he's produced, um, I used within that blog uh, with his permission. Um, and also um, he, he basically merchandises the whole lot. So um, yeah, thin sections. Um, and in terms of the, the kit, which is actually used in order to produce thin sections, it's actually relatively simple. Um, that it uses a combination uh, of a diamond saw in order to cut the, uh, the rock into um, rectangles. Um, one of the flat surfaces is then um, smoothed off and, and, and uh, glued using epoxy resin to a glass slide. Um, and then the, the top of that rectangle is cut or ground off 
um, down to a thickness of, 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 of 0.2 of, uh, of a millimeter. Um, and then you have everything you need in order to be able to go with a thin section. So it's just a question of, of, of cutting and then grinding it. So uh, it looks like we're back in slides. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start talking to that again. Uh, could we go back one, please, Kerry? Thanks. Brilliant. So the last thing about categorizing um, stones I wanted to talk about was that in, in um, the way in which stones are cemented, um, sometimes the patterns which are formed, particularly when iron is involved in, in producing the, 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 the cementation of those stones during diagenesis, produces some fabulous patterns. So on the left here, we have a, a piece of boulder from um, King Edward's Bay, um, just underneath the uh, Tynemouth Priory. Um, which has been eroded from the, the shelves of rock there. And on the right hand side, you can see a beautiful eroded piece of stone, which is part of the Tyne Mouth Priory, which gives a really neat example of um, where it seems extremely likely that the source for the stone that was used to construct at least part of the Tyne Mouth Priory um, is exactly the same as the material on the beach just underneath. And it wouldn't surprise me in the, in the slightest if. Um, some of the quarrying that was uh, done was just exactly there in order to produce the home mouth priory. So we've reached a point where our grain of quartz um, has traveled from its uh, magmatic mountain home um, down through the rivers um, and into the deserts in order to create the set of sandstones which we can use as a source for building a wall with. So if we could have the next slide please Kerry which is a map of the, um, of the geology of, uh, of the Hadrian's Wall District. Um, and this is simply to say that there are a whole range of different types of sandstone of different age. So on going from right to left, from east to west, in Newcastle upon Tyne, you will see that there are these gray and dark gray rocks, which are um, the most recent of the Carboniferous rocks, which form part of the Pennine Coal Group. Um, and they consist of a mixture of shales, coals, and sandstones which are laid down in, in river channels. And then as we move further west, we go into these um, limey yellow green uh, rocks and the blue colored rocks. Um, these are also carboniferous, but older um, than the, um, the Pennine coal measures. And these form part of the Yordale group, um, which are a cyclic set of, again, a lot of sandstones, um, siltstones and shales and the occasional coal but also a number of limestones as well. And then finally, we move across to the Western part where we've got these pinky reddy rocks, which are Permian and Triassic in age. Um, and these sandstones, um, some are formed in rivers, but some of them are formed under desert conditions as well. And as the color on the map suggests, these are very distinctly uh, reddened being formed in a, in a really um, hot desert type of environment. Um, and are really distinctive and quite different from um, the set of Carboniferous sandstones which you find further to in the central and eastern part of the district. So this is just simply to say there are a lot of different types of sandstones um, and there are um, ways in which we can distinguish those. So let's have a look at the way in which the sandstones might got, have got onto the wall. So um, here we are back at Walltown Crags again. Um, and already alluded to this in, in the discussion we had earlier about, about Walltown and Crags and what's going on there, and some of the things which you can see on the map. So if we have a look, if we could have the next animation, please, Kerry, um, that it may be, um, and that certainly logistically, as far as the Romans were concerned, that sourcing stone from quarries right next to the wall would, would make um, the amount of effort involved in, um, in making the wall really quite small. And it just so happens that um, at this particular location, we know from those uh, workings brackets, disuse close brackets, just to the left of wall town crags, that there's some really good quality building material, material really handed, handy to the wall. But it may be that in other locations, if we get a next animation, please, uh, Kerry, um, that depending on which direction the wall is being built at that particular time, they've kind of got a road in place. So the road might have been another route 
um, by which you could bring good quality sandstone along the length of the wall relatively straightforwardly in order to then place it on the wall and, and build it. Go to the next slide, please. And there are other alternatives. So, for example, if we think about um, the area to, 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 to the west, and this is particularly interesting in terms of construction of the wall, and as you will know that originally it was a turf wall, and it was only later on that it was turned into, into a stone wall. Um, and there are two things uh, about the western part of the wall. One is that there is almost um, no uh, remnant of the stone wall, very little of it actually remains. And also the outcrop of, of, of stone, the, the access to the stone here is very, very limited. Almost the whole area is smothered in, in glacial rubbish. Um, and it's very difficult to, to find or, or, or extract um, decent sand, sandy sandstone material. Um, now we know that, for example, at Kirkpatrick Fleming, um, the next animation please Kerry, um, just north of, of Gretna Green at the top here, um, that there is um, really good sandstone within the, um, which is, is, is still being used in the quarries up there, but also really visible within the stream sections there. So maybe, if we have a look at the next animation, um, it would be easier in this particular case, uh, rather than taking it down the M6, um, to actually float it down one of the rivers and then, next animation please, simply to boat it across the, the Solway Firth. So maybe this is another uh, route by which the, the sandstone could be, could be sourced and brought onto the wall. The next slide please. So the wall has been constructed. So what happens next? So even in a place like this at Steel Rig, um, and particularly after it's been so wonderfully reconstructed by, 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 uh, by Jane and her team, um, there's an awful lot of the wall which ain't there. Um, there's uh, more than double the height of the wall here, which has gone somewhere else. And if we have to look at the next slide, please. And there are other places where there's really not very much wall at all. So who did steal the wall? Um, and I don't know about you, but these sheep look really pretty guilty to me. Um, and there's an awful lot of sheep there. And I know they, they, they're pretty stupid animals, but I think this is just pretense. And, and when you think you know, that uh, sheep are capable of forming a, a formation team on the back of a motorcycle, I'm absolutely certain um, that they're quite capable of, of, of shifting um, material around under the cover of dark. But other than the sheep, if we could have the next slide, please, Kerry. There are other obvious ways in which uh, the stone from the wall gets removed. So uh, here at Walltown Crags, um, there's obviously some um, very smug um, quarry owner who has ripped out a large chunk of wall here. What exactly that particular quarryman did with the stone, I think will probably remain a mystery. Um, but as a quarry man, he probably valued um, the, the stone that was actually taken off from this vast bite out of, of, of the wall. The other obvious way in which stone actually um, disappears, if we could look at the next slide, please. Um, and thank you to Andrew Curtis of Hedden for this next particular um, picture. Um, that some of the wall has actually been uh, removed and tarmacked over um, for the length of the, uh, of the military road. And indeed, uh, in the urban environment of both Carlisle um, and more particularly in, in uh, Newcastle going out to, to, to Wall's End, um, a lot of the material there has been removed and buried under the urban landscape. But other um, options are available. So um, if we could uh, <laughs> have a look at the next slide, please. Uh, I'm really enjoying the chat at the moment. <laughs> um, but stone is a valuable resource uh, and land owners were really quite, quite happy to, to have some of this stuff on their land. Um, and it's great for um, military applications. So here at Thirlwall Castle, vast amounts of stone have been, have been reused. And if we go to the next animation, um, we've already had our wonderful volunteers 
um, busily measuring and looking in detail the stones which you see in Thurwell Castle. And I hope that we're going to have um, a, a lot more um, time to explore this castle to uh, understand in, in a more quantitative way how much and on what sort of stone is needed in order to build a castle and therefore to understand how much wall you need to use up in order to build a castle like Thurwell. And there are other military places along the wall. So for example, the next uh, animation. Um, so this is the Peel Tower um, in Corbridge um, and another defensive building, um, which we'd like to spend some time looking at. And the, the owner of the Peel Tower is, is happy for us to do that as well, which is great. But not only military applications, but also um, uh, the ecclesiastical mob got involved in, in the stone robbing as well. So here in, in, in Corbridge, there's this wonderful Roman arch inside, inside the church. And if we go to the next, look at the next one, please. Uh, Lanacost Priory also has a, a lot of material in it, um, which has probably been removed from, from the Roman wall. And interestingly, some of the material in, in this, and if we could have the next animation, please. Um, this is the beautiful medieval church, um, old church just outside Brampton, that preserved in Lanacost and, and this church, um, the um, is, is some of the uh, only bits of Roman stone which have been sourced from the, the Permian and Triassic sandstone. So they are of particular interest in terms of not only understanding where the stone has gone to, but what the Roman wall was actually like before that material was removed. Uh, and if we could have the next slide, please. Um, and one of the others. Um, intermediate has this is Drumborough Castle, which is a, a, a fabulous place, um, and it's, it's kind of a, a hybrid um, military installation and farmhouse vernacular building, um, uh, but rather wonderful. Which also um, is remade, uh, uh, has been remade out of uh, what is probably a lot of Roman material. Which you can have okay, the, the next animation, please, Kerry. Um, we can see. Um, part of the wall cap in one of the lockdown um, partial listings we managed to get, go and get a look at. Um, that looks like a shed load of Roman wool to me um, and the wall cap team getting quite excited by it all, even despite the vast amount of rain that was falling on us at that particular moment. Um, and indeed, uh, this particular installation also made off with the next animation, um, which is an altar stone. So there are plenty of um, potential um, um, culprits for what's going on um, by way of removing stone from the wall. Um, and just to finish off with, um, I just wanted to add that there are a whole pile of other um, possible places to, to which the wall uh, might have been removed. So go to the next slide, please. At one extreme, um, there are vernacular um, buildings such as farmhouses, um, cottages, in which um, there may well be Roman material. And indeed, um, here at Plain Trees, um, it may be that some of the, the, the dry stone walls uh, may or may not contain uh, Roman walls, Roman material. Um, and this is one of the reasons why um, it's such an important thing to be able to, to work with, with communities across the whole length of Hadrian's Wall and where uh, you are so important in being able to, to, to make this project work. Um, now, I understand a little bit about the geology and that what I want to do as part of this project is to um, make the, the geology and the landscape and, and, and the, the, the mechanisms by which it's formed and the material which these uh, um, these, these rocks are made of, uh, accessible to you all. But in order to be able to get at the archaeology, and in particular where some of that archaeology resides, it sits within the communities across the whole length of the wall. Um, and this is why this project, um, and indeed the ability to be able to record that information through the uh, fantastic app, which Catherine was showing us earlier on, um, is, is, is something which makes this project so exciting. There is one remaining uh, culprit that we need to talk, talk about, and if we could have the next slide, please. <clears throat> Which is that slow, persistent 
geological process that I talked about earlier. And if we have the next animation, please. So here in Lanakos um, and also at Time Mouth Priory, we can see even in the um, relatively small number of centuries that these particular institutions have been around for, um, that geological processes is having its effect on, on these buildings. And if we have to look at the next slide, please. And it is interesting that the Romans seem to be really good at choosing their um, materials and that the sandstones which they chose are fantastically durable. And uh, in fact, they seem to be better at choosing their materials than, than either of the, the medieval monasteries did. And then it may be that the medieval monasteries were more interested in the, um, the ability to be able to shape those stones than they were about the durability of them. Um, but particularly in the central and eastern section of, of the wall where um, really good quality sandstones were available the, for the Roman wall is still in jolly good, jolly good nick. But nonetheless, when you start thinking in geological time, um, that the ultimate fate of all of the Roman material will be that it will be returned to um, sand grains and go back into the geological cycle. And then at some stage be uplifted into mountains and turned back into granite again. So we come back um, to the final slide, um, which takes us back to this um, thought about the uh, life cycle and the parallels it has with, with their own human life cycle and that um, the effect that um, life has on us and our ability to conceive um, timescales and indeed to, to be able to uh, think in the extraordinary and uh, deep abstract time of that geology allows us to think about and think maybe a little bit beyond um, our own political and indeed our own uh, lifetimes to think about and use the past in order to be able to understand what's going on now and what might indeed come up in the future as well. So with that thought, I'm going to say thank you very much indeed for, for staying with all these large numbers of words. Um, and um, if you've got any questions, more than happy to try and answer them if we've got enough time left. So thank you.